All right, well, good afternoon, everyone. Um, thank you for joining us today. My name is Pamela Bouchard. I'm the Director of Member Engagement here at ATSA. We will uh, be taking questions at the end of our presentation. All you need to do is select uh, the Q&A um, button on, on your Zoom navigation bar at any time to submit a question. And now I'm going to turn it over um, and, and to uh, Stacey Techner. Thanks, Pamela. Um, welcome everybody to ATSA's second annual, or second annual, second virtual town hall. Um, we're excited today to bring another topic to you, an exciting topic on innovation and training and engaging your staff. Um, I, as I said, I'm Stacy Techner. I'm the new president and CEO at ATSA. Uh, for those who were on our last virtual town hall, you probably know me as the new guy. For those who don't, well, I'm the new guy. And um, as the new guy here at ATSA, if you wanna get in touch with me, if you have any ideas for future town halls, ideas, questions, thoughts, or you just wanna connect, um, I would love to hear from you and you can always reach me at newguy at atsa.com for my email. So I look forward to connecting with you. Um, as we're looking at today's town hall, we know that everybody's dealing with unique new challenges related to the COVID pandemic. Um, here at ATSA, our whole team, even though we're working virtually, remains committed to providing you resources and service to help advance the roadway safety initiatives that you're all involved in. Is, uh, one example is our government relations team is busy every single day and night and even on the weekends advocating for the industry to ensure that our members are considered essential. Um, right away, we sent letters to every governor, lieutenant governor, um, Department of Transportation, just to ensure that everyone within our industry is considered essential and can keep doing the critical infrastructure work that you're all involved in. With social distancing, we've also developed some new resources. These virtual town halls are one. We, did, we debuted these two weeks ago uh, with, a, with our government relations team again, and we gave an update from AASHTO uh, President and CEO Jim Timon and Representative Brandon Boyles from Pennsylvania. And they gave great insights into um, the response to COVID as well as infrastructure funding for the future. We're committed to continue to do that. Um, we're also adapting our training. You're gonna hear more about that today. Our TCT and TCS courses, we were able to pivot very quickly and put those in a virtual setting. Um, and we're working with all of the DOTs, state DOTs, to ensure that that virtual training is acceptable within each state so that we can keep uh, your workforce going. And in this time, it's a great time because so many people are unemployed to bring new people on and get them trained for your workforce as well. So we remain committed to helping you do that. We've also launched new online training curriculum for human resources and workplace safety so you and your staff can access it when it's convenient for you. It's an on-demand program, uh, virtual program, so that if you need to access it late in the afternoon, you can do that. If you need to access it at night, I'm assuming you could probably do that too. Um, the virtu these virtual town halls that we're having today are also expanding to our chapters. Um, so if there's a specific issue with a state DOT, our team is committed to reaching out and putting together a virtual town hall for your um, state DOT, state representatives, state legislators. In fact, I believe tomorrow night, if you're from the New Mexico area, the first one is launching with um, Nate Smith and his team are putting that together. Our member engagement team has been doing an incredible job right along with our board of directors, reaching out to every one of our members to find out what is it that they need? What is it that you need? If there's something you need um, that ATSA can make your life easier, and help you deal with the COVID and everything else that's going on, we're committed to helping you. And our member engagement team has been doing a great job. In fact, we remain committed to responsibly following national, state, and local recommended actions. But while we postponed events like the legislative fly-in, um, we're still doubling down on our efforts to help you navigate whatever it is you need to get through this time. Know that we're here to help. And more importantly, we're just appreciative that you remain a member. We, we thank you for your membership at ATSA. And again, please stay in touch with us. Please continue to take advantage of programs like this. 
And if there's anything we can do, reach out again to the new guy at atsa.com. I look forward to meeting you in person one day, but for now we'll do it through the screen. And I'm gonna turn it back to Jessica to take us through the valuable information she has for us today. Thank you, Stacy. I'm gonna share my screen real quick. All right. So thank you, Stacy, and hello everyone. While ATSA has been conducting online training for many years, none of us have experienced anything quite like the current situation. This pandemic has caused us to rethink and retool our training programs to ensure that we're meeting the needs of the industry. Requirements for training have not changed and time stops for no one. So how can we continue to deliver training while keeping everyone safe? Classroom training is often viewed as superior and ATSA conducts over 300 in-person training courses annually. However, e-learning is a completely viable option that should not be overlooked. ATSA has been providing online flagger training for roughly six years, and the pass-fail rate is directly in line with classroom flagger training. Numerous students have become certified TMA operators after having taken ATSA's online TMA course, and our self-paced retroreflectivity for sign inspectors course is designed in a way that allows students to deter determine which inspection modules they want to learn about. Using our years of e-learning experience, our solution to the current issue, as well as staffing up the industry workforce while so many people are unemployed, was to quickly convert our existing traffic control technician and traffic control supervisor training to a virtual environment. We completely pivoted from classroom training and began reaching out to states to determine who would be willing to accept virtual training at this time. ATSA staff also held discussions with FHWA, who has agreed to accept training courses delivered virtually, as well as AASHTO, who's open to the concept. And there are many benefits to converting our existing TCT and TCS courses into virtual training. Virtual temporary traffic control training is vital to ensure the safety of emerging vehicles, emergency vehicles, sorry, National Guard personnel, and trucks carrying much needed supplies around the country by continuing to maintain our roads and highways. It also helps to keep our roads safe for those fighting on the front lines against the pandemic. The acceptance of this type of training by state DOTs will allow workers across the nation to become certified while maintaining proper social distancing per CDC guidelines, instead of waiting until restrictions are lifted to attend an in-person class. State DOTs that accept online training and certification can also ensure that Amer the American roadway workforce will be ready to work when things go back to normal. Additionally, virtual training breaks down geographical barriers and allows students in various states to meet and learn together and learn from one another, thus providing an enhanced educational experience. To date, ATSA has delivered 15 TCT and 15 TCS courses virtually with a total of 172 attendees. Students are engaged, technical issues have been minimal, and the exams are secure. The success of these courses is a testament to the high caliber of ATSA's instructor cadre. We selected several of our top master instructors to tackle this new learning format, all of whom who have gone through a, vig a rigorous vetting process and formal train the trainer session. Lucky for us, we have an ATSA master instructor here with us today to tell us a bit more about ATSA's efforts, so I'm gonna turn it over to Eric Perry at this point to provide you a demo of some of our e-learning initiatives. I'm going to, yeah. All right, thank you, Jessica. Can everybody see my screen here? All right, excellent. Yeah, Eric Perry, um, master instructor with ATSA, been teaching uh, with ATSA now for about 13 years. I'm um, just going to kind of build on what Jessica was talking about um, with the various types of the training that are available to our industry today uh, in, in the various avenues that we are reaching out to folks and delivering training. That's one through our instructor-led tra classroom training, which I'll briefly mention. Uh, as Jessica mentioned, we do th about, about 300 of those every year. Our online training courses and kind of give you some ideas of of what, what areas that we have and what we cover there, as well as go through a demonstration of our virtual instructor-led training. 
and then briefly touch on uh, the blended uh, topic, uh, which Jessica will talk about a little bit later. Overall, Jessica really hit on many of these benefits, so I'm not going to spend too much time on these, but uh, research has shown that they are just as effective of, as in classroom training. And in some instances, students actually perform a little bit better uh, when they have the control of the content. And I'll show you that uh, in just a second. But as Jessica uh, hinted on, uh, the benefits of, of online training, the virtual training, is basically reduced costs to the students. Uh, previously, in, in many instances, when I was teaching uh, in North Carolina, I would have somebody fly in from, uh, say, Texas to take the course. And so it's, we're basically reducing the cost of airfare, hotel costs, and the overall travel time and making it more convenient to the student. Um, so that they can take it in the comfort of their home uh, in, in these current times or at their workplace. And as Jessica mentioned, it, it basically is breaking down geographical barriers. Uh, we're, we're allowed to reach those hard to reach agencies that don't typically have the funding for uh, travel to get to our training courses. As I mentioned, uh, currently on hold our instructor led classroom trainings are one and two day uh, offerings. Jessica mentioned that, uh, as well as our work zone safety grant training. Uh, which we uh, currently are in year four of a five-year contract, uh, basically offering some of our uh, top bred um, classroom uh, style training. Uh, we're in negotiation, as Jessica mentioned, with FHWA to try to uh, pivot and, and learn how to, to better provide that uh, applicability within the works on safety training. As far as ASCII is concerned, Jessica hit on uh, the flagger uh, certification training. Uh, that's been available for several years now, as well as some other uh, options are. And I'll show you a, kind of a snapshot of some of these courses as well. We cover human uh, resource training, some general training, uh, some general workplace safety training, uh, and some topics that are covered there. Uh, once again, check our, check our website out there for, for those, as well as state-specific courses. As you can see here, um, some, some five snapshots of, of the different courses that we offer. In the upper right, uh, I should say upper left-hand corner, we cover some general um, worker environment uh, safety. In the upper right-hand corner, your sexual harassment training. Uh, in the middle, we're covering the California state-specific uh, guide to, to working in hot conditions. And then uh, acute respiratory illness uh, in pandemics, that's our COVID-19 uh, response. As well as you can see, some of our courses have been um, translated over into Spanish. Uh, bear with me, I'm going to try to stop and start this video here is this kind of highlights uh, some of the um, applicability with the Zoom platform that we're using currently today. As you can see in the upper right hand corner, uh, our instructor is walking through a series of PowerPoint and talking uh, with the instructor just like they were in uh, the classroom uh, in environment. So he's basically walking through the slides, telling the, the students of what's going on and, and how to interact. It gives them kind of an overview of the Zoom features uh, that are available to students and showing them how to uh, mute themselves and unmute themselves, use the chat pod, raise hands, answer questions, and, what, and so on and so forth. And I'll be demonstrating some, some more features that uh, we're basically highlighting. Uh, in the Zoom platform. One kind of qualifier within our um, in-classroom training as well as in our online classroom training, uh, we basically uh, have to disqualify students if they miss more than uh, so much of, the, of that training course. So uh, our restrictions are one hour of absence or inactivity in the course will disqualify the student from receiving credit for that training. Um, so essentially we as instructors can monitor the students uh, while we're delivering the course. So if somebody gets up and walks away for a few seconds to go get a drink of water or whatnot, he'll come back and we'll notice that. But if he is gone for extended periods time uh, we will have that uh, conversation with them. Uh, continuing on, we, we give the mat materials to students electronically, and then those are paired up with our actual slides within the PowerPoint, and it kind of gives them an idea of where to look back and forth between the electronic, electronic documents that we give them, uh, as well as the PowerPoint slides. Uh, 
I'll spend a, a couple of seconds here, a few min a minute or so here on the exam. Uh, we're still administering the exam. However, with our exams, we're doing them electronically. Uh, as you can see here, we're showing you an example of a traffic control technician course with 50 multiple choice questions, 80% to pass. Uh, what we've done in our virtual environment is actually given them 90 minutes to take this test. So that allows them to flip back and forth between the electronic documents and the actual test to be able to complete those tests um, in, in the time limit uh, applied. Once again, we're, we're meeting the certification of our certification board. Um, and we're basically allowing them an open book, open note test and making sure uh, as instructors, we're basically monitoring their video feeds to make sure that, they're, that the information that they're using is not someone else and basically the materials uh, that are provided to them uh, through the course. So basically they get sent an electronic link and they basically go over to that and the instructor will monitor. This feature here is basically we're showing um, a, a solution to one of our workshops. We have a series of workshops through each of our courses and Bill here is, is interacting with the students and answering questions uh, with, with the students. Uh, and he's basically showing the different features of how to set up the advanced warning sign spacing, how to calculate tapers and buffers and, and so on and so forth. So he's basically demonstrating on the actual uh, MUTCD drawing and allowing the students to understand and comprehend what's going on. And once again, he's interacting with the students on uh, dynamically, uh, essentially as they're asking questions. And he'll scroll up and kind of uh, here in just a second and kind of show them the different features uh, of that particular uh, workshop. In this example, we uh, as instructor like to gain the feedback, so we interact with the students both verbally but also through the use of these poll questions. Uh, essentially, we ask them a series of questions, and in this case, we're doing a knowledge check for the temporary traffic control technician course, slides one through 40, and basically asking them to answer these questions to see if they get it right. And in the end, um, we'll basically share the results with the students to figure out who's getting the right answers and allows us to concentrate as instructors to make sure the students are actually learning the material. Uh, the next video that I have queued up is uh, Juan Morales, one of our chief, he's our chief instructors. Uh, he's basically demonstrating a video, a, a piece of a works on equipment that's that's running through and he's kind of demonstrating uh, in, in a live environment uh, of how this piece of equipment works basically picking up the individual modules placing picking up and then moving it over and setting it down and this last part uh, of the video basically is me demonstrating to the students and figuring out the actual workshop uh, solutions live and in person i'm i can use the the features within um, Zoom to basically write on the, the diagram as the students are giving me the answers in real time and then providing them with the actual solution there at the end. Um, and with that, um, um, my portion is done. I think I'm, I'm turning this back over to Pamela. Thank you, Eric. Now um, it's my pleasure to um, introduce two of our ATSA members as we discuss how industry leaders are adapting to virtual training. First, we have Dave Waldo from the Alaska, the Alaska Department of Transportation. Good morning. Good morning. Thank you for uh, joining us today. Um, can you tell us a little bit about your state and the situation it currently finds itself in? Well, like all of you, uh, when we had to start canceling all of our spring uh, AFSA courses, both our corporate contract courses and, and the national courses that you guys were putting on, um, we were really concerned because our construction season is very short. And uh, so we reached out to, to AFSA and, and, and I talked to uh, Jessica and said, hey, you know, we've got to do something because our contractors, uh, we have a certain number of contractors who really needed this training so that they could get out on these jobs that are actually starting right about now. Um, and so after a little bit back and forth, uh, uh, it turned out AFSA was already working on this, but the big issue for us was we had to ensure that, that virtual training would um, comply with our standard specifications. So I worked with our chief engineer and we just simply looked at the specification and it, it looked like it was gonna be fine for us um, as long as AFSA's content was similar and uh, we're gonna pro provide the certification for the traffic, traffic control supervisor uh, we, we saw no reason not to go for virtual training. 
um, we felt like it was, you know, maybe not our first choice, but certainly in this you know, instance, it was kind of our only choice. So considering the uh, geography of your state, af after COVID-19 is over and, and social distancing guidelines are relaxed, is the DOT planning to continue with virtual training? Oh, I think so. In fact, it's something that I've mentioned before, um, but I, I don't know if there was enough, um, you know, other folks that maybe were interested in it. But certainly in Alaska, uh, I think it's something we'll utilize. Um, again, it's not always uh, the best choice, but uh, with oil at 10 to $20 a barrel, we're probably not going to be doing a lot of traveling. So um, I think in the future, uh, this is going to be a good uh, backup tool for us. Okay, um, we're gonna have a question and answer uh, session um, toward the end. So if anybody has any specific questions um, for Dave, um, you can go ahead and submit those through uh, the Q&A box on the navigation bar. I'm now going to turn to uh, Cindy Williams, who's the president of Time Striping. Uh, Cindy, um, could you uh, sh uh, tell us a little bit about your company and the situation that you currently find yourself in? Sure, thank you for having me. We are a 30-plus uh, year contractor in the state of Arkansas, and we started out striping years ago, moved into guard, uh, I'm sorry, traffic control, and then into guardrail. So um, we currently have everyone back from layoff. We're running about 110 employees through the uh, season and we are in full-on construction season right now we feel like we're a little bit in the twilight zone we are thank God we are essential and proud to be that but at the same time everything else seems so different out in the real world we're, we're dealing with lower traffic counts we have limited contact in the office the phones don't seem seem to be ringing as much uh, the state workers are working remote so it's kind of a new normal for us. Okay, so you've been very proactive in the past sending your employees to classroom uh, training. Uh, during the crisis, you reached out to us to find a way to continue training your employees. Um, when we told you about the virtual training, you immediately signed up. Can you tell us a little bit about why you feel uh, virtual training is a benefit? Absolutely. We actually had a large class scheduled for several different contractors in the state who had requested the training. We needed some training. We had some others here local who needed some training and we had had to postpone because of COVID-19. And then there was the fear we're going to have to postpone again. So when the thought came to do virtual, we jumped on it and said, this is absolutely something that we want to take advantage of. So uh, we went to the Arkansas Department of Transportation. I spoke with um, our safety person there, uh, Eddie Tanner, who is a uh, uh, director of workforce, I'm not going to get his title right, but went to him and just said, what do you think? Will Arkansas accept this? If we, if we get the certification still, though, be it virtual, absolutely was fine with it. Took, took it to his bosses and said, yes. So bec even though everything is so different, we were still able, it, it's kind of a new normal, I guess. We're just going to have to, to deal with, but no, uh, some training is better than no training. I think we've discussed before. It's just nice to be able to get that training because like I said, we are still running full tilt right now. So we know a lot of students taking these courses aren't exposed to this type of technology. Um, what can NASA do up front to smooth the way for them to ensure they have a good experience? That was probably one of the negatives that I heard about the training was, um, I know I had one individual in particular, and I know no bones about it, I'm in the same generation as he is, and he said, I'm not doing it, I'm not comfortable with it. He definitely wanted a teacher in a classroom, and, and we understood that and said, you know, we'll get you next time. Um, I think anything you can do, Eric, I really appreciated hearing how you're doing the training with the Zoom so that people understand it. I myself am new to all of this, so learning how to mute and unmute and video and stop video, um, giving that information to the students up front and really walking them through that tutorial is going to be huge key. Uh, one other thing was just making sure that you know kind of the learning styles of your employees. Some people are, this is how they want to do it. 
this is what they're used to the I hate to say younger and older, but you know the younger generation they're they're all about the electronics and the technology, and they're okay with it. Some of us are a little slower on that, so we're just making sure we know what they're doing. One uh, specific concern that came up from one of the attendees, uh, I guess at the end, their iPad was not compatible to take the test, so they had to work out something uh, there at the end to figure out how to give the exam to their students. So just anything we can do to continue to work with everyone as we present this new platform. And what would you say to other company leaders that are in a similar situation considering virtual training? Oh, absolutely go for it. Uh, I think my preference and even those that I spoke with, I spoke to uh, four of the different contractors who had people in the class uh, last week. They all still prefer a classroom setting, but understood this time and place, this is what we've got. And so let's get the training out of the way so we can continue to work. Um, you, you really need to keep in mind the, the lack of networking and um, like the war stories came up two or three different times, being able to share that information. So uh, maybe continuing to offer the training and, and tutorial on being able to raise your hand, ask the question, use the chat bar um, so that they, they can have that discussion and, and conversation piece that they're gonna miss being in a classroom together, but absolutely still go for it because we've still gotta be trained. We're still working. We have to be trained. Okay. Well, thank you, Cindy. Um, again, uh, we have the Q&A option. Um, there's some questions coming in, but if anybody wants to submit additional questions, you still have time to do so. Uh, I'm going to turn it back to Jessica before our Q&A session. Great. So, okay. So thanks again, uh, Pamela. Thank you, Eric, for uh, walking us through that demo and, and Dave and Cindy. Great feedback there as we continue to move through, through all of this and, and, and see what ATSA training is going to look like. So speaking of which, looking ahead, we know that there's a possibility that work may never go back to business as usual. So we'll continue to offer training solutions to the industry that evolve along with the times. Every day, more DOTs are coming to us and asking for e-learning options for both their employees and contractors. Within the past few weeks, 13 states have begun accepting TCT and TCS training virtually to manage the situation. Uh, you just heard from, a, uh, from one here, Dave, in Alaska. Some states are also postponing or extending certification expiration dates. Uh, Illinois just switched their certification period to four years. And uh, we have some states like Idaho that do not accept online flagger training that are now um, willing to accept it for a certain period of time just till we get through this. We also know that work is still taking place, even more so than in years past due to low traffic volumes, for example. We're hearing that states are closing major interstates during the day, which would have never had daytime closures in the past. The fact is that road workers, as Cindy mentioned, still need training and ATSA is pivoting along with you. So how will we adapt now that this new normal is knocking at the door? If social distancing has taught us anything, it's that productive meetings can still occur even when everyone isn't in the same room. Companies will be reevaluating uh, travel plans and policies, and sending someone to a classroom training course may become a thing of the past. Uh, attending a short four-hour training course in person typically costs the student an entire day of work, not to mention the travel costs that go along with it. To prepare for this, ATSA is going to partner with a curriculum development firm to determine the best platform to deliver ATSA's training courses in the future. Will it be virtual? Is it an e-learning or perhaps web-based course, or maybe even a blended approach? What is the most effective way to deliver this content? Once we determine our path forward, we'll be working to redesign and re-envision our training for the most effective delivery and learning outcomes. So we're excited about the future of ATSA training and really want your involvement along the way. Help us build the next 50 years of ATSA training. We'll be sending, you a tra uh, sending out a training needs assessment to all of our members to ensure that we're meeting your needs both now and in the future. So please be on the lookout for this survey in your inbox tomorrow. Okay, thank you, Jessica. So that concludes um, 
our portion. So now that that segment. So now we're moving on to um, our Q and A. Um, I do have a couple of questions here. I have a um, a question. I think this is geared toward um, probably uh, Cindy or Dave. Um, so for your students that participated in this, um, were they all in the same room or did they do this all on individual computers? Uh, I'm happy to answer that. We had four or five different contractors involved with this course. I personally had one individual from my company and bless his heart, he sat in a room by himself for three days with a computer. And so I don't know that he was really wonderfully excited about that. But then there were others who said that they were all in the same room on individual iPads. Thank you. That's actually uh -huh. a, question, a question I did not ask our, our master instructor here from Alaska, um, but I'm assuming that most were uh, individual. Uh, although I, I have heard that uh, the feedback has been uh, pretty good from the students. He says that um, uh, it's going really well and they're satisfied with the course, and um, which I think is fantastic. Hey, Pam, I'd like to jump in here. Yeah, we've actually done this in the past before under the grant where uh, we will actually do an instructor-led classroom training and then actually project it out to uh, other states. So the one example was in South Dakota, I believe it was. So I, I did a class to about 10 people uh, in person and then we were able to broadcast that um, to I think it was like four or five different locations where they had uh, either one or two participants or a group of participants. So I think there is some flexibility to do it with, with both uh, environments, one person or multiple people in the room. Thanks, Eric. We're going to go to the next question. Um, Cindy and or, or and or Dave, I mean, how how what's what's the best way for um, folks to um, encourage their states to approve virtual training in the future? Any tips or suggestions? My my first suggestion is just ask. You know, we we actually are um, lucky to have a member uh, on our chapter board who works with R dot. Uh, and, and we just took it to him and said, what do you think? Do you think that, that the state would go for this? He is actually in charge of safety for RDOT and he took it to his chief deputies and uh, just walked it up the chain and they were all in agreement. We need the training, we're still working. And it, all it was was an ask, don't be afraid to reach out. Uh, same goes for here in Alaska. Um, we just worked with the chief engineer who's the deputy commissioner and uh, we reviewed the spe our specification and luckily it was general enough it, it didn't actually say classroom courses it just specified the certification and the agencies uh, in, in t involved in teaching those courses so um, it was a pretty easy lift for us and uh, we made the decision pretty quickly. Thank you. So the, one of the questions is around um, the list of the DOTs that are allowing the virtual training. I know Jessica showed that map. Jessica, is that map located somewhere on the website? How does that get updated and how often? So yes, we, we do have a virtual training map on our website. So if you go to atsa.com and look at our virtual training landing page, there's a link to that uh, map. If you wanna Google it, you could just Google Ads of Virtual Training. It's one of the top pages that should pop up for you. Uh, but there's a map, it's interactive. Uh, it, it's updated as often as, uh, as soon as the state tells me that they're willing to accept, we update it immediately. And I, I believe that the updates occur twice a day or something like that. So I guess the answer is daily, uh, but it's updated frequently the, the moment we hear from anyone. And I think it's also important to note that while we have 13 states that are currently accepting, we have several more that are considering it or working on it right now. Um, and I did see uh, someone asked if there was a way to get on a, uh, a mailing list or something to find out when new states are added. So that's something that I will chat with um, our marketing team, perhaps we can add a little sign up there on that page. Uh, so, so that's folks who are interested in finding out if their state or any others accept that they can, they can be notified. So Maria, 
uh, or, or sorry, <laughs> Pamela, I, I answered that one for you. Thinking Maria because I'm giving her work, unfortunately. <laughs> <laughs> Um, so, uh, Cindy mentioned something about an iPad and, and access to a test. What, what type of technology or minimum requirements um, does somebody have to have at home to do this virtual training? So, we, the, the current requirements that we're requiring of students is one, that they have a computer with a microphone access as well as a video camera installed or a webcam access. This is because students must be seen uh, throughout the entirety of the course and at least heard minimally during the exam. We wanna make sure that you know, during the exam portion, maybe a student hasn't picked up their phone and is calling someone for the answers outside of the screen. Um, you know, just any, anything that we can think of like that to help um, preserve the integrity of the, the exam. Uh, during the course also, they'll need a microphone so that they can ask questions. In addition to that, they need to have Zoom downloaded, which you can get free accounts um, uh, through zoom.com, uh, or you can purchase an account if you want, but that's not required to take out to training. We're the ones that have the account set up for that. And then students also need Adobe Reader in order to access PDFs. And um, really, th that's as far as it goes, as far as technology is concerned. Uh, our biggest goal is just making sure that they can be seen and heard and that we can acknowledge the fact that they're actually in that course. And, and to touch on what Eric mentioned earlier about the one hour of inactivity, it's the same thing that we would do in a classroom course. If someone leaves the course for half the day and thinks they can just come right back in, we, we're not going to give them credit for that, that course. These are certification courses that have our requirements. So we're doing everything we can to keep um, the integrity of our training at top notch. Okay, and does it matter if somebody has a Mac versus a PC? No, that does not matter. The only comment I will make is, is something that Cindy touched on. Our exams are not responsive. Uh, they will be very, very soon, but at the moment they're not. And what that means is if someone is using a tablet to access the exam, it might look a little bit wonky or not work at all. So in our student requirements up front, we do recommend a computer uh, instead of a, a, a tablet or an iPhone or anything like that. So uh, to try to eliminate those issues up front, but when it does happen, we've been working with folks and, and helping them out. Okay, I have a question from a member. Um, what does it take for somebody to um, receive accreditation to become an instructor at ATSA? Great, so, so that's a question uh, kind of aside from virtual training, we have an application process for master instructors. Uh, we also have a corporate training program, similar situation. Um, you have to go through the application process, then it involves an interview process. You have to take all of the training courses that you wish to teach and have scored a 90% or higher. Uh, and the other, and then you have to go through a train the trainer session with our chief instructor. Typically attendance to those is limited to no more than six individuals to make sure that you're really getting um, the tools you need in order to begin to conduct training. I think it's important to mention though, that ATSA, does not is not always bringing on new instructors a lot of that has to do with demand and and how things are going in the industry uh, but we are always taking applications and looking to find out who is interested because you never know when we will need to bring someone on uh, it could be the moment they apply it could be a month a year later it, uh, regardless we'd like to have that information on file and follow up with folks who are interested and I did see quick, real quick, Pamela, a comment from a corporate instructor here. Hey, Ben, uh, you can provide uh, virtual TCT, TCS training through your corporate instructor agreement, uh, as long as you can, uh, you know, meet the guidelines that we've kind of already laid out that you're watching students and all of that. So Ben, touch base with me after this and, and we'll work it out. Okay. And, and then there's a, just a question for um, around um, how ATSA defines virtual training. It, you know, some, so some um, organizations offer self-paced e-learning. So how does um, ATSA define virtual training? Sure, I'll take that one as well. And um, uh, sorry to keep stealing the, light, the limelight here, but, uh, <laughs> or so to speak. Uh, we define our virtual training. So we offer a few different things. 
We do have online training, which is typically self-paced. Uh, that's our online flagger course, our TMA course, our introduction to the MUTCD, those types of courses. Those are online, they're self-paced. This type of training is virtual instructor-led training. So in this, in the TCT or TCS training courses, you do not have to go through the content yourself and kind of teach yourself by following along. You actually have an instructor who's there live with you answering questions. So that would be the, the main difference here. We really don't have anything at the moment that's blended or anything like that, more just online, self-paced or virtual instructor-led. Thank you. Um, there's a question here, uh, costs associated with Zoom. Um, I believe that anybody can download Zoom for um, to, to be an attendee at no cost. Is that correct? Correct. All right, so it's just if you want to host a meeting, there could perhaps be um, fees associated with it. But for our, for our participants, um, they don't have to they don't have to pay for a subscription. Correct. Okay. Um, I don't see any other um, questions um, from anyone. Does um, anybody, Eric, or anybody have any closing um, closing remarks? So Pamela, I, I hate to jump in real quick, but I do see a question coming through the chat box and I just wanna make sure I address it. Um, I, I did see a question about what extra training is being provided to instructors. Uh, so we are uh, providing to, uh, basically toolkits for instructors. There's tons of resources already in existence on how to provide a, a, a quality instructor-led virtual training course, including not to open your blinds and, and blind uh, students from you know, the light glaring on you. So we've been working with a lot of those tools, but in addition, all instructors have gone through multiple training sessions together. And aside from the very first instructor to do this, because he didn't have the option, all other instructors must participate in an existing course and teach a portion of it by taking over all of the controls. So that way we can make sure that they know what they're doing and can fly solo before we let them teach an actual course uh, on their own. So um, I wanted to make sure that I touched on that. And I believe, I believe that's the only other one I noticed. So sorry, Pamela. No, uh, I, I, wanted to, I wanted to also add in that we also are providing as a staff that's uh, overviewing the course and basically helping the instructors uh, with te any technical questions, whether students uh, log in early and are having problems downloading materials and whatnot. So there is an as a staff person assigned to each course, as well as an instructor to provide uh, some support with, these, um, with each of these courses. All right, and there is just one more question um, that came through regarding, um, have there ever been any exceptions as far as um, students having to be on camera for the entirety? Um, sometimes companies have policies where cameras are disabled. So is there, is there any way around that? Is there any kind of work around? So um, uh, we, at this point, no. So as you know, we had to pivot very quickly in order to address the need. And the way that satisfied and makes most of these DOTs comfortable is knowing that the student who actually says they're taking the training is the one that's sitting there. Uh, for example, with Florida, we have to verify their driver's license via the video camera, and they have to send us their TIN number through the chat. So we have, we're doing everything we can to, to help the states and make them feel comfortable with the folks that are receiving this training actually being the ones that are allowed, uh, or, or those who signed up and who are taking the the exam. We've not run into any issues yet with anyone not being able to use a camera, but I imagine that when we go through our processes with uh, redesigning and re-envisioning our training courses, we will look into items such as this for individuals who maybe don't have that, excuse me, capability and, and coming up with a disclaimer or a, a signed agreement or something. All right. Well, I think with no more questions, that concludes our town hall discussion today. Um, again, this session was recorded, so it will be posted on ATSA's website in the next uh, 24 hours, and you can locate that at www.atsa.com. Thank you again for your participation.
concludes our meeting. Have a good day.